All right, very good, very stimulating talks. I'm gonna ask our uh, panel members to come up to the uh, podium if I could. There should be uh, Dr. Verschragen from the University of New Mexico, John Chabot, University of Columbia, Dr. Rafid Hassan from the National Cancer Institute, and Dr. Avital from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, come up here, we're going. We're going to um, uh, present a couple of unusual types of scenarios that occur in the management of individuals with malignant peritoneal mesothelioma, and then I'm just gonna ask our panel members to uh, give us their uh, thoughts in terms of, you know, what are the important considerations on how you, on how you manage these issues. Uh, before we start, I, just, I think it's important to just put things in perspective for those of you in the audience who may not uh, see things from a strategic perspective. This disease, peritoneal mesothelioma, was initially characterized as a distinct clinical entity in the early 1970s by uh, Dr. Mortel, who was a very well-respected nationally, internationally recognized oncologist at uh, the Mayo Clinic. And about 15 years later, uh, Dr. Karen Antman at the University of Columbia at that time and her colleagues, who are some here in this room today, published a very influential paper showing that you can, in fact, treat this condition with integrated programs of care, and it was the first description uh, that her group showed that regional therapy using surgery and radiation and chemo at that time uh, can translate into very good outcomes. It was in the 90s that this approach of cytoreduction with intraperitoneal chemotherapy really became a much more accepted practice in individuals with the suspicion that this was a particular group of individuals who could benefit from this type of an approach. And now in the 2000s, you see a quantum change in our approach in that we're now studying this tumor at the molecular level and we're seeing some information that to me is going to fundamentally alter how we approach this condition to the point where one day someone will walk into a clinic, the tumor will be analyzed at a molecular level and we'll be able to provide that individual with a therapy that is tailored to attack their particular individual tumor. I think it's remarkable. And, and just to put it in perspective, if you think about how we used to look at this disease in terms of things that influenced outcome, patient's age, their gender, the histology of the tumor, that's like this room. And I brought this analogy up last year. This room is a cancer cell. And every one of us in it may be one of the genes. We're flying a plane at 60,000 feet in the air looking down at this room trying to figure out what's going on. But with molecular techniques, we can walk into this room and we can look at every one of us as a gene. And I can look at Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Hausner right there and say, he's the culprit, he's the bad guy, you're out of here, okay? And that fixes the problem. It's an incredibly powerful tool. So I'm very excited about the future direction with this research that we've heard about today. So I'm gonna just, uh, I have a couple of scenarios here. I'm gonna present one and I'm gonna ask Claire to start off here. Claire, in somebody with malignant peritoneal mesothelioma, who's a good candidate for site reduction and undergoes that, we do know that there's a very heterogeneous biological behavior to this condition. If you have an individual who has undergone what's considered to be a successful surgical intervention and they recur in the abdomen, and let's break it down into two different scenarios. Somebody who's recurred six months after the treatment and someone who's recurred three years after the treatment. How do you counsel those individuals in terms of what options they should be considering? A clinical trial, a clinical trial, and a clinical trial. <laughs> so, good for you, that's very important. I would applaud that too, yeah, it's a very good thought. So, um, well, I'm gonna vary a little bit from your scenario okay. because most of patients that uh, have peritoneal mesothelioma carry a huge burden of disease. You could see those beautiful CAT scans there. And I think they do better if you start with chemotherapy to kind of reduce the bulk of the cancer and then send them for a hyperthermic perfusion or a good debulking if you don't have access to hyperthermic perfusion surgeons. And then what I do is uh, try to consolidate the remission with intraperitoneal therapy. Um, but that's not quite your question. So, um, and someone that recurs much later, uh, I, I like to watch until the patient really has symptoms of, uh, uh, that, that tells me that the disease is there. 
And um, such sim symptoms include a, a new clot in the leg or somewhere else, uh, pulmonary embolism, fever, loss of weight. Um, I think these are the main symptoms that uh, one can talk to the patient to. Uh, the other ones are in the blood, like an increase in the platelet count, an increase in the white blood cell count, a decrease of the albumin. And when the patient really becomes symptomatic, it starts to affect their life. That's when I'm starting treating them again. But no, if I have a clinical trial, that's really what I offer the patient. Yeah, no, I think that's a yeah. very that's a very good point that you bring up. Uh, I'm going to uh, just change the question uh, for Dr. Chabot, and then I'll come back to Dr. Hassan. So, um, Jean, when you, you, you like me, uh, will have patients that will come back to you after having what's considered to be a successful cytoreduction, reduction, and they've recurred. And so, generically, what are the factors that you think about in terms of whether or not a second operative procedure is beneficial or whether or not we should be conceding that surgery is not a good option for this individual and we need to consider other things? Uh, just like your analysis of molecular pathology, we need to look at the details and we need to customize. Um, if you think about the pattern of failure, that's going to guide the strategy going forward. Why does intraperitoneal chemotherapy work better than systemic chemotherapy for this disease? We believe that we are delivering a higher dose to the cancer cell than we can possibly deliver to an entire human body that that body can tolerate. So what I am always looking for in that setting is what's the pattern of recurrence? And there are, there are two failure patterns. One is a failure that you look at that CAT scan or you look at that person and you recognize that the disease is sort of popping up all over the place and, and that's a fundamental failure of the treatment strategy. So you have to move on to a different treatment strategy. If it's a, a technical failure, and what I mean by a technical failure is there's a portion of the abdomen where there's a preponderance of the recurrence and everything else looks great and the patient is doing constitutionally well, they feel well, but you see this single focus and you can construct in your mind that there's a rational reason that there was a failure of delivery of the therapy. And that's what I mean by a technical failure. That if you can get to that region and deliver that local regional therapy, the intraperitoneal chemotherapy in a, in a better way, in a more effective way, then I would repeat um, surgical debulking with intraperitoneal chemotherapy for that pattern of failure. So it's a, it's a careful analysis mm -hmm. of time course mm -hmm. and the appearance in particular on CT scan. And Dr. Hassan, for you, I wanted to ask you about a, a somewhat common pattern of recurrence, which is somebody who undergoes a successful cytoreduction and has a significant interval of period with no evidence of disease progression, and then they show up with a CT scan that shows both pleural and intraperitoneal uh, disease. It could be ascites in the abdomen and a pleural effusion. Uh, this is, we presume, due to the fact that there can be extension of the mesothelioma through the diaphragmatic lymphatics or straight through the diaphragmatic tissues. Uh, you know, how would you recommend approaching individuals who have a pattern of recurrence which is in and out of the abdominal cavity? So as you mentioned, it's uh, not an uncommon scenario and I'm sure we all see patients like that. I think the key for peritoneal mesothelioma, I'm a medical oncologist, but I really think that the key is surgery, and I think surgical debulking prolongs survival, and uh, many of these patients get surgery two, three times, so I think it is key. The problem comes uh, either at presentation, we see patients whose disease is in the abdomen, that's where they have the peritoneal mesothelioma, but they have some involvement in the chest, it could be a pleural effusion or it could be a lymph node. So the traditional thinking for other tumors would be that this is stage four, it has gone outside the abdominal cavity, and uh, therefore it doesn't make sense to be aggressive in the abdomen. But really, looking at the patients treated over the last three, four years, I think that I would offer that patient still to have the debulking surgery. And if it is a fluid in the chest, we drain it. And even though there is disease in the chest, such as lymph nodes, we could take care of it later with systemic chemotherapy. But I think their survival really is determined by the abdominal disease. So I, uh, 
have these patients where they may have limited chest involvement, I suggest that they get the abdominal surgery and later on will follow it with chemotherapy with a limited cyst bladder. Dr. Vishragan, would you, would you agree with that? Uh, you know, obviously outside the context of clinical trials, your approach for somebody who has this kind of a pattern of recurrence? I probably would start with chemotherapy first and send them, I, I agree that they need a debulking. Uh, I'm not quite sure when is the best time to debulk them. And there has been a bias, you know, because the, that's a disease that's mainly surgery treated, mm -hmm. uh, to start with debulking. But I think that if you can get them in a better condition with some type of partial remission with the chemotherapy and maybe get rid of the pleural effusion, they'll be in better condition to go to surgery. Mm -hmm. But I agree, they all need surgery. I'm not saying that they should not be operated on. Very good. Now, I'm going to give a different scenario, and this is a, not an another, another uh, problem that does occur. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Chabot for suggesting this. Very frequently, when somebody is uh, initially diagnosed with mesothelioma, the method is a biopsy through the abdominal wall or a laparoscopy in which the tumor is identified and biopsied. And because of the fact that the tissues through which the biopsy was obtained have been contaminated, you can get a growth of a tumor in the abdominal wall. Uh, this is not a life-threatening problem, but it can become a significant uh, symptomatic problem. It's a local control problem in that uh, these things can grow and become very painful and uncomfortable. So the question is, how do you treat that? Obviously, the tissues there are contaminated. Surgery has a role. Are there other things that we should be doing here? I'm going to actually ask Dr. Chabot to start, and then we'll work back this way. So Dr. Chabot, in the context of somebody who has an abdominal wall recurrence, with or without other things that are going on, how is that best managed, would you say? I, you know, if it's in the context of the patient requiring systemic chemotherapy and it's relatively small and not painful at the time, I would move straight to systemic chemotherapy. If it's an isolated event, the patient is doing well in every other way, I would do what it takes to get that lesion out. And we do that kind of surgery in, with a very different mindset. Dr. Alexander and I were trained, you know, when you operate on cancer, it's this big, you operate this big to be sure you get around everything and be sure you get every cell out. Well, we change our mindset typically with peritoneal mesothelioma because we know we're completely dependent on the additive benefits of chemotherapy. This is one of those situations where I have that old-fashioned mindset and I'm going to operate well around the tumor what we know is we're not going to get very much benefit in a tumor that's got significant bulk to it from systemic chemotherapy. And why that is, we don't quite understand. But we don't want this thing to come back. So generally, operation with sometimes fairly complicated reconstructions of the abdominal wall using various meshes and prosthetics, and sometimes even plastic surgeons helping with moving tissue to replace what we have to remove. Dr. Hassan, would you, would you advocate any role for radiation with, or without, with surgery as the initial management, or how would you approach an abdominal wall recurrence? So it uh, depends. If they need systemic therapy, I agree with Dr. Cheval, then it is, uh, we do the systemic chemotherapy. But if that's the only isolated recurrence, I usually send them to my surgical colleagues. I, I never use radiation. So. As a primary modality. Yeah. Dr. Roshagin? I think there was a negative study just recently published of radiation in port sites that didn't show any difference right. with or without radiation. Was so I'm in, not in, sure. Uh, in meso patients? I think so, yeah. I have to look. I can't recall where I saw that. Can I turn that question around to you, Rich? <laughs> to me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> No, 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 no. I should have gone over the procedural points here first. The, the flow of questions generally is from the podium this way. <laughs> no, I, I will say, I, I, I mean, obviously they're always individualized, but I do think that surgical resection is the right way to go. I, I struggle with the fact that there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns with respect to the amount of tissue that you take out. I do like to get back to what you think are normal, healthy tissues uh, without putting somebody through too much reconstruction. And in the context of having a microscopically positive cells, I have traditionally used radiation, although I'm going to have to reconsider that based upon these data. I'm going to have to look that up, but I didn't realize that that was a, uh, not, not effective. So um, I have a question for the surgeons here, because I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, 
Um, there was a surgeon who was not dealing with mesothelioma but with ovarian cancer in France called Daniel Dorjean, mm -hmm. who switched his method of laparoscopy from CO2 insufflation to hook because he said that the hook uh, relieved some pressure in the abdomen and the, the metastatic port infection or, or the infection of the port with metastasis was much less. Mm. Mm. What do you think about that? Well, I'm just going to, you know, just, I'm going to have to speculate on that. But I, I think that the the thinking is that the positive pressure acts as a as a way to help cells contaminate the yeah. tissues through the port sites. And and the there body, are some animal models yeah. showing. That yes, happening. exactly right. Um, so it, it needs to be it needs to be studied. But I would also say, in the context of other laparoscopic procedures we do for cancer, that uh, the port site recurrence rates have generally been very low, uh, very very low. Well, with meso, it's a little different, and so you bring up a good point. Yeah. Is it really that different with meso? If you think about the frequency with which these patients undergo laparoscopy and the frequency with which they've undergone uh, traditional operations for um, presenting symptoms that, uh, and, and it's unknown they have mesothelioma, the number of times they have paracentesis, the number of needles that cross through the abdominal wall, I think if you think about the frequency of those events, that the likelihood of seeding is actually remarkably low. Um, so uh, I, I think in most areas of surgical oncology, the, the issue of port site recurrence has been very overblown. Uh, I think standing on our heads to do things in a way that is suboptimal, um, and then not doing the primary job terribly well to avoid this actually relatively rare event is probably not a strategically smart thing to do. We also see this, uh, I agree, I guess there are no studies to, for the data, but very common you know, in plural mesotheliomas, much more than our lung cancer patients, we get many of these procedures. So it does appear for some reason there is uh, affinity for these cells to track, but uh, I agree it's not a huge problem, but it's a problem in some patients. We're getting near the appointed hour. I'm going to just ask one other question of our um, of our panel, and then we'll adjourn this uh, session for this morning. And it, it relates to an unusual presentation of peritoneal mesothelioma. And I'll just give you a scenario. It would be a woman, typically between the age of 30 and 50, who undergoes an operative procedure for a totally unrelated condition, and the surgeon notes several papillary excrescences on the serosal tissues. He or she biopsies one of those, and it comes back as a well-differentiated papillary mesothelioma. So we're faced with now an individual who's undergone an operation for an unrelated condition who has an incidental finding of a few of these excrescences in the peritoneal cavity being interpreted as a well-differentiated papillary mesothelioma. Dr. Verschragen, how do you approach that problem? Um, well, it really depends on the pathology report. If it's just no, first of all, I, I would send them, depending on what the problem was for which they went to surgery, we send them to a very good CAT scan to make sure that we can or cannot see any disease left over. If there is disease left over, I think it's a surgical disease. They have to get surgery, uh, maybe with a hyperthermic per, uh, perfusion, but chemotherapy is not going to work in these ladies. Um, if there is very little disease, I may watch them. You may watch yeah, them. I may watch them until you know, a CAT scan every three to four months. If nothing moves every six months. Yeah, that's the trick here is yeah. to understand what is the biological behavior of this. Exactly. And it may be I mean, you want to watch many, them you know. just to make sure that disease is really going to progress. Dr. Hassan? So if it is uh, really a well-differentiated uh, mesothelioma and the CAT scans are totally negative, uh, I would watch those patients with CAT scans and uh, then uh, if there is a progression of the CAT scan, then I would prefer surgery would be the optimal treatment. You bring up a good so point. We agree. Which is, <laughs> yeah, they agree. That there is really no indication that earlier intervention is going to be any more successful than waiting until there's some indication of some biological progression. But Dr. Chabot, if you could... Give us your uh, thoughts. The first thing I would do is make Dr. Borzak reread the slides. <laughs> <laughs> because every decision you make is dependent on the accuracy of, of that reading. Uh, I'm, I would not um, do an aggressive um, intervention with that patient. 
the patient who has widespread disease with cystic formation and, um, and, and any symptoms one might consider uh, debulking and sometimes debulking without HIPEC in a, in a woman whose fertility remains very, very important to her. Uh, I tend to follow these patients with annual laparoscopy rather than any ionizing radiation or, um, or cross-sectional imaging. And cross-sectional imaging, we're looking for fluid usually. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing a mass. The only thing that, that tells us there's something there is some telltale fluid. With laparoscopy, we can both actually see the disease and we can get sequential biopsies and look for evolution under the microscope. And if that disease is evolving toward malignancy, then I would intervene. intervene. So selective approaches. Very good. Well, I want to I thank uh, Mary Hestorfer and the MAR for uh, uh, organizing this breakout session this morning. I want to thank all the presenters and our panel members for what I thought was a very stimulating series of uh, lecture, so thank you all very much. Any questions?